The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program, depending on their content. Uh, yesterday, I was so excited telling you about the Baha'i Temple, especially the dome, and how Early did that with his team of artists and craftsmen. I left out some amazing facts. He began the project 11 years after he submitted his first samples. The Baha'is wanted competitive bids. The project manager spent one year traveling around the country by train in those days with all these big drawings, talking to the terracotta, stone industry people, cast metals people, cast stone people. Everybody was excited about the project, so we'll get back to you, and never did. So they could get no other bids. Early spent four months working with the project manager, structural engineer, to prepare the bid for the whole project. From the time they got the contract for the dome, and it was a, all the work was a time and materials plus fee contract. From the time they got the contract, they had the job completed on the dome in 18 months, including building a whole new plant for their production of the precast. I just uh, can't imagine doing that today. But what I'd like to tell you this afternoon is how John Early brought color to concrete surfaces, especially surfaces. And it's not just on the surface, it's in the material. And we're going to talk about the artist, not just the man who made concrete beautiful, but the artist who made concrete beautiful. John Early said, concrete can satisfy the most extreme requirements of form, color, and texture desired by architects and artists. And he went on to prove it. We just uh, talked a little bit about Meridian Hill Park, which was one of the first uses of color. He did some urns and a few things with colored aggregates. But in particular, I wanted to show you this slide where he achieved his mosaic-like appearance. He wanted those pebbles, a uniform size, packed tightly together in the surface. That was his mosaic effect. He also began using lots of color. And the color was achieved not with pigments, but he crushed stone and screened it. He crushed tile. He crushed ceramics. And he put them in patterns and shapes. The Parthenon in 1921, that project, which he did the exterior architectural cladding, if we will. And it was both precast, cast in place, and applied stucco type uh, installations. That he, he did with. Um, color in the material to match what had originally been painted according to historical records on the original Parthenon. This, by the way, is really worth a trip to Nashville. It's an actual size replica of the Parthenon, including the interior. But he used his material for the statuary, for deep relief elements, and uh, architectural moldings. This piece on the bottom is a sample in the museum at the Parthenon, and it's one of it's, it's an example, 15 inches long, four inches high, five eighths of an inch thick. This is the key element that Early used, as he described it, his thin slabs. He wasn't talking about what we think of as structural concrete slabs. He was talking about his decorative slabs. And as you will see, he combined them in a lot of ways. Now notice in particular, in the blue, the color in the packing is not as tight and uniform yet. This is early uh, in the initial work. The same even with the crushed brick or uh, ceramic reds. Not quite as tight and uniform as the pebbles at Meridian Hill Park. 
Here you can see, though, that his sculptural work, his architectural sculpture, was superb. Um, they were working with sketches from uh, the architect, and uh, they created each of these panels as a precast element in the studio and shipped it down. This is 1928, interior of the Parthenon, and if you look on the top, you will see that the colors are much more, I would say, intense, uniform. The delineation between the colors is much crisper. He used the grooving technique between the colors at this time, by 1926. Let's just go back. Here in the bottom, he separated the colors by the relief, the different heights of the uh, shapes. 1922, here in Washington, and this is a building that we'll go in to see tomorrow morning on the bus tour, was where he first did what I would call his polychrome, uh, multicolor, illustrative work. And the interior is filled with these remarkable not paintings, but concrete slabs, tiny slabs. You can see very clearly some joint suggestions here. The architects prepared very detailed, delineated uh, renderings of all the, the uh, artwork and elements they wanted. Early did additional research on the religious iconography, but he, he took the geometry used that to create tiles, thin slabs, his thin slabs that were like tiles. These were 5 eighths to 3 quarters of an inch thick, 12 to 15 inches, in this case almost square, curved, he, he made, he did the plaster curved surfaces for his mold so they fit together and once he had a mold it was just a matter of the artisan repeating casting. And if you look around the top, you may notice there are the same geometric patterns, in some cases repeated, but with different colors. The little stars he would do by putting a brown coat for stucco on that dome, pressing a mold with grooves. So he squeezed that mold on the surface and created raised ridges where the star was. The workers then, the artists then applied the star mixture of concrete into the grooves, and then they screeded with curved screeds the uh, azure blue sky. You can see down below he's starting to use his grooves for the molding in these cases, getting away from having to use raised relief. So how did he do this? Let's talk about the process. Here's, here he is, uh, actually he's taking the photograph, but they're in their, they're in their uh, model-making studio. And uh, unfortunately, we've got very little in the way of photographs for this mosaic process. That was architectural work. But the Baltimore Sun-Times did do a very good article back in 1968 when early studios was cre were creating battle maps for the World War II and Korean War Memorial in Honolulu. And here you can see the commissioners meeting with, in, in the white shirt, uh, Richard Adams, the general manager of early studios, and the artist, Mary Lou uh, Morris Jacobs. And early studios hired Mrs. Jacobs as the artist. She worked for them as an outside artist on the job rather than the commissioner. But early studios would also take work done by the artists and created in mosaics or by the architects. They were flexible. There's a photo in color that was on the cover of the magazine. Mary is standing on some of the completed cast, precast panels. They were multiple panels installed vertically, as you'll see, but joined together. We'll come back to the, the actual installation. But here is Mary with the key ingredient the artist had to provide, and that was a cartoon. It was what I call a mosaic drawing, where colors are almost like a, a, a you would color in a paint by number set. Uh, certain colors create areas, and together the combination creates the illustration. She created many dozen of these drawings for the battle maps. 
On the left, she's doing watercolor studies, and on the right, you can see one of her finished cartoons or mosaic drawings. It includes all the text, all the symbols, all the colors that she wanted. Here you can see on the right the finished mosaic panel out in Hawaii compared to her actual size cartoon. Now they used acrylic letters for the text and they had a, an artist create ceramic inserts for planes and ships. This is what early studios did once they had the cartoon, number one. Number two, they identified the lines that would delineate the areas of color and at times lines that went through color to create additional relief. They then used uh, artist ponce wheels or pricks and punched through the artwork into a plaster slab, used uh, scoring knives to create grooves in the plaster slab where all the lines would be. They then created a second plaster slab mold cast into the grooves, flipped that over, and number four, they had the mold which had ridges. And you can see the artist installing the colored concrete mix between the ridges. We've got close-ups coming of that. Finally, after they cast the face color mixes, they put a backup, more of a plain concrete mix and reinforcing steel, and finally they get five, the mosaic, same size as the original cartoon. This is the only photograph we have historically of early artisans installing it. You'll see the grooves and you may make out some of the small porcelain planes. They had to, cre they had to create shallow depressions for each of those symbols in the mold. He's using half of a rubber ball as his cup. We know that from interviews with them. And they mix up the little ingredient and artist palette knives. That's how they place it. This is actually from our studio when we were creating additional new maps for the first Vietnam War Memorial out in Hawaii. And just to show you, you can see the ridges. They're about one eighth of an inch high and they're about one eighth of an inch wide at the base. They're, the yellow color is a form retarder. Early's form retarder was a very mild retarder. We combine retarders to get just the, the strength that we need nowadays. And as you install the first color, you go up to the ridge line. The second color has to overlap the previous color, so you're covering the ridge line. Altogether, we're placing about one quarter inch thickness of concrete, miniature concrete, I call it. Here you can see the Edison Memorial Tower and how early would combine different aggregates, blending them to create different shades of color in the mosaics. This, although it's an architectural sample, it illustrates their ability. This is aggregate from early's material that's been acid digested to remove the cement and sand. Notice how consistent it is in size and shape. This is porcelain aggregate as they would crush it and screen it to use for the colors. Early followed the Munzel color system. He was up on all the latest artistic theories and Munzel was not only very popular but it was very effective. On the top are two pages from what would be a, a, in Early's time the, the, one of the books published by Munzel about his color theory and it was a three-dimensional color chart. On the bottom is uh, a simple, simpler color chart, but to give you an idea, there's 400 colors on the bottom. Early searched, oh, I went too far. Early searched the world to get aggregates from Africa, Europe, South America, in order to get 200 unique colors of stone or opaque glass or ceramics or gilded porcelain that he could crush and use. With those, he could create multiple colors and shades and hues. This is just for the um, Edison job. He needed 14 different aggregates for that. On the um, Honolulu maps, they used glass, and it was both transparent and opaque, and they used pigment. I have not found pigment in many of other early projects. While Early was alive, he didn't use pigments. It was all the color of the aggregate. So the aggregate was very intense. The ingredients have to be batched very carefully so you get consistent color from one panel to the next. So you've got to, you've got to use scales, laboratory scales. You've got to have a consistent uh, 
mixing procedure, and it takes six to seven artists from eight to 14 hours full day working just to complete one panel because there might be 30 different batches of colored concrete, each one taking requiring 20 minutes to mix. This is what it looks like when you take it out of the mold, a chalky appearance because that's the cement paste on the surface. Using small brushes like toothbrush size or smaller, begin to expose the colored aggregate. Finally, you've got to get down to dental tools to clean out the grooves and crevices. But this is an example of what those grooves added to the relief, light, and shadow of the artwork. And you can start to see even the sand plays a role in the hue. Here we're creating a thin slab like Early would have done. There's 30 different color mixes in that slab. That slab is 5 eighths of an inch thick. It is then set into a mold for a larger panel because we had an additional 28 colors for the rest of the mold. Couldn't do them all at once. I don't know how Early kept his slabs flat. We had a terrible time with curling, by the way. Um, now, what did he do with the slabs? He combined them with his stucco uh, installation methods to create whole walls. And we're going to go through some details. Remember, his, his slabs didn't have to be very long, but they repeated, and he could hide the joints in how he combined them. So here you have a slab. You have sections of molding, sections of horizontal band molding, sections of curved molding, strips sections, and he installed those on the building with a brown coat to hold them in place true to line and plane, he then would install his field of, in this case it's a tan mixture, as a stucco application, screeding off of his moldings. Here you can see two column capitals. Each of these were constructed around structural columns using thin slabs, four-sided, and multiple levels, if you will. If you compare the bottom, uh, you'll see that kind of a cruciform shape of a flower with the uh, acanthus leaves. Same mold for these two columns, different colors, different effect. So he was able to get very economical and efficient production. Here you can see him using relief. He was very clever with his shadow control, the, the control of light, shadows, co blending colors together. And by using that relief, both in uh, recessed grooves and raised areas, and this is all happening within about three-eighths of an inch thickness, this, all this relief, he, he created wonderful color. Now I'm going to show you, if you can see, this is pretty well delineated or defined colors, but it's done by relief. He filled a shallow part of the mold, and then he filled the next little knob of the mold. And you, you can have a uh, kind of overlap of the colors where the, one raises to the next level. Here, in the same church, as they were getting better, he used grooves and those ridges in the molds to, de, to, de, to um, separate the colors. The colors are much more crisply delineated in this radiator cover, fanciest radiator cover I've seen. I wanted to show you the difference between Early's mosaic concrete, which is in the perimeter frame, and a traditional tesserae mosaic, which is in the center. One of the huge differences which shocked me when I finally got to Hawaii after I had bid on the job and got the job was Early's work is far more detailed, about four times as detailed as traditional tesserae mosaics because they have to work with something they can pick up with their fingers. Early's mixes go in as a whole batch. He used the color in his architectural moldings, entrances. We'll also tomorrow visit the Franciscan Monastery. There's multiple projects there, many types of things. Here, just to show you the exquisite control they had in mold making for these columns and casting within the molds. This is just one detail along the uh, rosary portico, it's called. And I want to show you how they made that. Here they were placing the colors into molds for the upper band 
I don't think they did that in place. But you can see that they were laying the colors in without the ridges. And see how it's a little blurry? Same thing down here for the letters, although this, I believe, they did press into the brown coat to create some ridges. It's almost a little better in its delineation, but it's still not as crisp. And if you go on the tour, you'll see this is flat. There's no grooves. The cross has some relief, so it looks a little crisper. But notice how he blended colors of aggregate to get shades. The Ascension Shrine, they did not only the architectural cladding, but the interior dome. And it's fabulous, really brilliant colors because of their aggregates. And I wanted to show you here how you can identify his thin slabs. The top of the, of the palm trees, all those leaves and the, uh, uh, it looked like pine cones, but the, the cones, those were part of one slab. And you will see there's a slight change in color between the background around the tree and the color between the leaves, even though they were using the same aggregate. So they cast these slabs, same with the saints. They're done in thin slabs, curved to follow that dome. They put a brown coat on, set the slabs into place, to, into position. When they had that ready, they then did their background color in a stucco application. This had to be done much later because it used the grooves and very sharp delineation of all the details. On the right, you'll see uh, in the black square, gold leaf, I took that photo 20 some years ago, and the letters were gold leaf. I couldn't reach or get close enough to see if he used the gold aggregate, which he did in some places, a, a, a gold vase porcelain. But uh, last year, you, the gold leaf had worn off. You can see the purple color of the letters. Early also did sculptural work at the Franciscan Monastery. The Louisiana State U University in Baton Rouge, 1924. They precast moldings and medallions and shipped that down. They did six to eight different churches in the 1920s. These are fabulous. Sometimes you'll see some of the same moldings, same uh, iconography used, but wonderfully different colors as you look at the different churches. This is not paint. This is colored aggregate. And it's permanent. <laughs> At the Reptile House here at the National Zoo, Early did the entranceway, and he did um, delightful little uh, details uh, that went into the around the brickwork. Another artist had done the the artwork, and look at the brilliant colors of this. This is now 90 years old, <laughs> and all the color in these curved panels. He created that purple shade by using a bright red and a turquoise color together. And he blended the sand even, blue and red sands. Or with a gray aggregate, he used green sand, so it's a green gray. This was the type of artist that he did. In uh, Houston, he did a wonderful church there. Buffalo in 1927, but it was, this one's closed in 93. In Baltimore, Maryland, when we visited there, I managed to bump into the parish church to, uh, par pastor to let us in. He, did, he thought these were painted. He didn't know what they were, actually. When we told him that's all concrete. It was very dark, hard to get any photo. He also, they, they weren't uh, particular about styles. This is a much more Art Deco style for an entrance to a church, 1936. The Scottish Rite Temple was on the bus tour tomorrow. This is the largest precast panel that they cast at one time. It's huge. Now, I don't know exactly how they even reached the middle of that panel. Um, beautiful. These monumental urns, I've gotten the question many times, how did they make these? They are in the round, and there's ornament all over, and beautiful colors. So I'm going to show you just a little bit. The lower left, you'll see this scroll-like detail. And around the edge, you see the groove? That detail was cast as a thin slab and then placed into a mold that was just one segment, maybe 25% of the diameter of the urn at that spot. Same with his, his round medallion. And they would cast just 25% of the curve, roll the urn, put in the next medallions, cast another 25%, roll the urn, cast the next, and they would get a cylinder. They combined that on the right 
with segments that they made, and you can see the yellow is one of the joint lines, and there's a second joint line down below that almost has a grout in it, and you can see vertical joint lines, very hard to, dis to detect because Early used the same mixes to join things together. And here's color for battleships. Brian Blundell was able to get these photos about a month ago. It's in uh, the Naval Model Basin uh, testing facility. It takes us through naval history and, and the progression of battleships from sailing to steam to diesel. And they're just wonderful, about six foot, seven foot wide panels, three, three and a half foot tall, and around the meeting room. He also did hallway uh, architectural details. I want to show you in the, in, at this though, 1936, he has really mastered this style. And he is using those grooves to delineate elements in the illustration, not with color, but with grooves. So if we look close, He's got railings, he's got guy wires, he's got uh, the, the gunnels for the lifeboats, and he's done that with his grooves alone. He also changes the size of the aggregate from the quarter inch up in the brown to eighth of an inch in the white and even smaller in the black so that he gets it into the, all those detailed areas. Another church, 1939, he passed away in 1945. He sold the studio for a dollar to Basil Taylor, his lifelong partner at, at the studio. And Basil Taylor then carried out the Baha'i Temple interior. As I mentioned to you yesterday, early studio's bid was lower than plain plaster ornamentation to do it in polychrome mosaic. Here they did not expose the side of the ornaments and they created a third hue of color with just two mixes because they didn't expose the aggregate along the sides. But the, the results are just fabulous. The Islamic Center is about eight blocks from here. Beautiful turquoise aggregate used for the um, uh, scroll kind of ornamentation throughout. I wanted to show you uh, the, an entryway that combines precast arches with granite in the round columns. And if you look on the right, you'll see the precast. Remember, these are thin slabs assembled. Now, they were, they were a little thicker than Early's decorative slabs, but they're thin precast. And a, a thick, solid cast capital where they used the crushed granite that was in the round, polished granite column below. And in this way, they, they uh, blend the colors. The first battle maps they did were in 1953 in Brittany, France. Here they used primarily stone and porcelain aggregates, just a relatively few shades of color, and they cast symbols and letters uh, limited. In Honolulu, though, if you get a chance to go out to Hawaii, you have to visit the battle maps in Honolulu. Here they used, because they're extensive, first of all, and second, they used crushed glass. And if you look at the detail of the eagle's head, that creates multiple hues with, of color within each mix. They also used pigments in this case for the different colors. And I think this is one of their best single uh, illustrations. Now this is Mary Morse Jacobs' artwork. They translated it into mosaics. That scale covers the line, the red, Yellow and blue is two inches in size to give you a sense of scale. And look at what they have done with the colors and the tan arm and the greens in the uniform and so on. It's just a fabulous, fabulous uh, art format that is pretty much lost. There's, there's uh, not much of it being done, but because uh, it's very labor intensive. <laughs> so that's early as an artist in color. And if you have any questions,